All right, so if I'm not mistaken, we are ready for our first presenters. And uh, what, a, what a couple they are. It's Martina Hoffman and Pascal Ferry who are coming to us from France today. And uh, uh, I, I just have become a little bit familiar with Pascal's beautiful work lately. Martina's work I've known for about 15 years. Uh, psychedelic, uh, visionary inspired visual art and absolutely stunning absolutely stunning material. Uh, deep explorers of psychonautic states and wisdom. They have much to share with us. Their uh, talk title today is entitled um, The Inner Journey and Transmutation Through Art. Bienvenue, welcome Martina and Pascal. Hello everyone. <laughs> Hello. It is a great pleasure for Pascal and I to be joining all of you today. And uh, thank you, Stefan Gray and Zoe Lam, for the gracious invitation. Uh, our talk today is somewhat uncharted territory because Pascal is French and will be presenting together for the first time. So I will be speaking in English. And, and I in French. And we'll, and we'll be having subtitles, subtitles so, so no, not to worry, you'll be understanding everything. So uh, uh, a brief introduction to our talk. Um, these are certainly very curious times and have in a way prompted us to stop in our tracks somewhat simultaneously. And, uh, and uh, certainly there have been many uprooting world scenarios throughout the ages, but... Uh, this is, this is perhaps the first time in recorded history that we are experiencing a global event simultaneously and in a way, in a way truly collectively. And, and this halt has for many created um, inner silence and forced us to face ourselves perhaps on a deeper level. And, and um, with, this, with this, they could be potentially an experience of, of being unsettled or frightened, and it is also an auspicious time at the same time. As it, as it offers us the opportunity to also take detailed account of our individual as well as global situation and see whether this is truly where we'd like to be, and hopefully we can find solutions for change together. Gracefully, there are many wonderful and special tools available to us, and uh, this brings me to our presentation, which is the inner journey and transmutation through art. Enjoy, enjoy the show. It's going to be very colorful. With this presentation, we'd like to take you on a chronological journey through our lives as visionary artists and highlight the events that have led us to live and represent the wondrous spiritual inner journey in our art. Choosing the path of the artist has given us an invaluable tool to express and integrate these profound experiences. And both the inner journey as well as art have become the alchemical processes that have transformed us and consequently transmuted our lives. Pascal and I are very passionate about the important role that visionary art may play in raising awareness about the need for shifting global consciousness in today's world. The daily practice of creating art as well as the experiences with non-ordinary states of consciousness have also given us incredible tools for navigating the challenges of our inner and outer existence. This presentation will illustrate some of them. We hope to share deeply and authentically with you. Forever sharing, this age-old tribal tradition has proven to soothe and support our human existence as well as aid it in finding solutions together. In indigenous culture, such moments have forever been addressed by consulting the spirit world or the divine for guidance. Traditionally, this is done through vision quests or shamanic journeys with spirit plant medicines that will bring about insights and healing information for the seekers or their community. In today's world, times of crises often leave us individually as well as collectively unprepared and unsupported while traditional indigenous societies have often prepared their members for such difficult moments through specifically arranged rituals guided by a trained spiritual leader 
and these medicine people carry powerful knowledge to heal and accompany their tribe members. Further, in a healthy indigenous setting, the collective community stands guard and accompanies the initiate with prayers and good intention during their spiritual quest. Considering these fundamental differences quickly exposes one of the greatest shortcomings of current Western society, in my opinion, the lack of a sense of belonging and not knowing our interconnectivity and interdependence with all living things on this planet. Forever, artists have attempted to make sense of the human experience by creating images that describe all aspects of our existence including the realms beyond consensus reality. In the cave of Les Trois Frères in France, we find other examples, the dancing shaman and the sorcerer, as well as the beast master in the cave of Gabilou. These so-called theory anthropes, half human, half beast, are said to represent the world and experience of the shamans that used parts of these caves for ritual possibly with the use of sacred mushrooms, as Graham Hancock suggests in his book, Supernatural. These shamans seem to be in the process of shape-shifting. So these images illustrate well the fundamental connection of so-called visionary art and the ritual use of plant medicines. Generally put, it shows the desire of the artist to illustrate the mysterious experiences and processes that take place during non-ordinary states of consciousness. And visionary art is especially prominent in indigenous cultures that have a sacred plant teacher at the center of their spiritual practice, such as is the case with the Huichol Indians in Mexico who use the peyote cactus. or the Amazonian Indians of South America who use ayahuasca or yahe. The women of the Shipibo tribe in Peru create intricate embroideries of Icaros or magic songs used during ayahuasca ceremonies. They are representations of their cosmology and the Shipibo can listen to a song or chant by looking at the design and inversely Paint a pattern by listening to a song. The main elements of the designs, the Shipibo designs, represent the Southern Cross constellation, which dominates the night sky and divides the cosmos into four quadrants, as well as the cosmic serpent, the anaconda, and various plant forms, notably the copy vine used in the preparation of the sacramental brew ayahuasca. From the 1990s forward, tribal ayahuasca art has been expanded by local as well as foreign artists who began creating ayahuasca vision-inspired paintings that show both the traditional as well as Western view. Anderson de Bernardi is part of the first generation of direct Pablo Amaringo students from his art school in Pucallpa, Peru. and Luis Tamani, who is one of our favorite next-generation medicine plant-inspired artists. Throughout Western art history, innumerable artists have also created images of worlds beyond the material, and many of these artists throughout the ages would imprint us with these mysterious visions of heaven and hell. Fantastic worlds, the mystical experience, the dream state, the inner journey, worlds of tremendous light as created by my partner of 30 years, my late husband Robert Venosa, the psychedelic experience, as well as the encounter with the divine. With this brief visionary art history as a point of orientation, we'd like to now share with you our personal experiences with non-ordinary states of consciousness and their expression in our art. 
Although Pascal and I grew up in very opposite parts of the world, he in France and I in Cameroon, Equatorial, West Africa, there are some striking parallels that run through our childhood and lives. Tout comme Martina, je suis enfant unique. Cela induit que nous étions assez souvent seuls et que nous avons dû développer beaucoup d'imagination pour jouer et créer dans des mondes merveilleux. J'avais bien quelques amis à l'école, mais j'étais très bien tout seul à chercher des pierres tombées du ciel, des fossiles dans les champs ou dans la proche forêt à ramasser champignons, fraises des bois et mûres en compagnie de mon compagnon préféré, ma corneille. Martina et moi avons passé également beaucoup de temps à ne rien faire. Vous savez, observer, contempler les animaux, les arbres, les plantes, et bien sûr, nous rêvions, nous méditions, nous nous évadions. C'était nos premiers voyages intérieurs. Very early in life, I became aware of my very lucid and powerful dream life and the way I was quite easily connecting with a world all of my own, as well as to nature. And spending time in nature and sitting under a tree would give me a sense of being part of something much larger than myself, of belonging and being held and supported. I was not always feeling this in my daily environment, and these experiences were not often spoken about in the outside world, which made me wonder whether I was seeing the world in the same way as everybody else was. So soon I began creating drawings to reconnect me further with my inner feelings and welcoming worlds, this very natural and second nature occupation and passion has remained with me to this day. At the age of six, my family and I moved to Cameroon, Equatorial, West Africa. Needless to say, this thick jungle environment was a huge contrast to my native northern Germany. I can say that the awe experienced when I first encountered the people, colors, smells, exotic sensuality of this world have stayed with me to this day. And growing up as a white minority in black Africa taught me very early in life that reality is not a unified experience, but rather a personal one. And being exposed to the African art and sculpture in particular would forever imprint my young budding artist soul. At this time, I developed regular and intense episodes of migraine headaches, which caused strange and visual as well as auditory hallucinations. It is through these experiences that I became aware of my inner voices, a sort of guiding force or my higher self kicking in during times of high stress and challenge. J'ai appréhendé mes premiers voyages très jeunes, vers l'âge de 12 ans, suite à des très fortes migraines qui sont apparues et qui se sont aggravées assez rapidement. Après avoir pris des antimigraines classiques, antalgiques, anti-inflammatoires, qui n'amélioraient en rien mes douleurs, notre médecin de famille nous parla de nouveaux traitements à base d'ergot de seigle, d'où le LSD a été synthétisé par le docteur Albert Hoffman. Il me prescrit un traitement de trois mois pour voir si cela était bénéfique pour mes problèmes de santé. Il me semble, car cela fait bien longtemps, que c'était sous une forme de spray. L'amélioration fut saisissante, mais cela développa également d'autres facultés assez troublantes au début pour un jeune enfant, mais ensuite très intéressante pour moi. J'ai commencé rapidement à avoir des visions, faire des voyages dans ce que j'ai longtemps appelé mon jardin secret. Que cela soit au collège comme en famille, je déconnectais facilement avec notre réalité qui ne me passionnait pas vraiment. J'ai grandi dans un tout petit village à la campagne en France, en Bourgogne, dans un environnement bucolique et magique, à l'oreille d'une forêt, en un temps où nous étions très libres. J'aimais par-dessus tout prendre ce chemin qui montait à cette forêt et me balader dans ce monde féerique. C'est lors d'une de ces escapades que j'ai saisi une autre réalité, un autre monde en observant des êtres étranges, vifs et joueurs. Ils ne ressemblaient en rien à des humains, ils étaient éthérés, vaporeux, irréels. Lorsqu'ils m'ont aperçu, ils se sont volatilisés en un instant. Un de ces êtres m'a accompagné toute ma vie, 
Cette première expérience avec les plantes, bien malgré moi, m'a fait saisir une infime partie de la complexité de nos perceptions sensorielles. C'est devenu au fil du temps ma première nourriture, totalement vitale à mes créations. From my childhood in Africa, fast forward to my years as an art student, and all of a sudden I find myself unexpectedly invited to visit a beautiful village on the Mediterranean in Spain. Here, synchronistically, I met the American visionary painter Robert Venosa. For anyone, but even more so for a young art student like myself, Robert's visions of light-filled worlds were beyond inspiring. And I would soon start my first oil paintings under his masterful guidance and gaze. While these early portraits were in essence photorealistic, they already showed backgrounds formed of energetic patterns, my future interest. Although Robert was 21 years my senior, we found great affinity, artistic, co-inspiration, and a great home in each other. And he would become my future husband and partner of 30 years. Besides our passion for art, one of the fundamental pillars of our relationship was the mutual interest in the mysterious forces that are at play throughout the universe and our connection with them. Robert had been part of the first generation of experimenters with LSD in early 1960s USA and was a seasoned explorer of the inner planes. In the early 1970s, he glimpsed a nanosecond vision that had occurred to him naturally, actually, in a meditative state of a brilliant, jewel-encrusted, overwhelmingly beautiful angelic being. And he would be chasing that vision throughout his entire artistic life, eager to share the great potential that the psychedelic journey has to offer to us. Robert soon guided me with the proper set and setting into my first entheogenic experience with LSD. Lived in nature, the high point was a taste of feeling absolute unity and being part of all consciousness in all places simultaneously. It was amazing. <laughs> Needless to say, this day would forever change my life in the most profound way and would set me on the path of becoming a spiritual seeker and a visionary artist, wanting to paint the mystical experience for good. And I'll be forever grateful for Dr. Hoffman's gift to the world. Another quick fast forward to the early 1990s when Robert and I met the one and only Terence McKenna. Our friendship with him and our many late night conversations, often animated by plant spirits, revolutionized our minds and hearts and made us reconsider. Psilocybin mushrooms, this time the heroic dose. The Shroom Realm has always given me great access to experiencing the fundamental interconnectedness and interrelation with Gaia and all living things and our inseparable interdependence. And DMT, the spirit molecule, became the magic word. Ralph Metzner came to visit and talk about a strange brew called ayahuasca began to grab our attention and a true spiritual renaissance across the board would begin for Robert and I, as well as launch a much deeper journey yet into more otherworldly lands than we had ever experienced before. So we began traveling to the Amazonian regions of Brazil to investigate the local spiritual rituals involving these spirit plant medicines and found them to be powerful tools for healing as well as spiritual growth. Amazing. It is legal to use this plant spirit medicine within the context of the ayahuasca churches of Santo Daime and Unua Vegetal, as well as in indigenous healing circles all over the Amazon basin of South America. Ayahuasca, or yahe, is a powerful psychoactive brew that is commonly made of two plants, 
or their substitutes, Banisteriopsis capi, the vine of the dead, or spirit vine, and Psychotria viridis, la chacruna, here a shaman, Don Guillermo, with chacruna and Banisteriopsis in his garden. Ayahuasca is a profoundly intricate chemical concoction that depends on the two components to come together for it to be orally active. The MEO inhibitor that is present in the vine enables the digestive tract to absorb the DMT-containing vision-producing Psychotria viridis. The brew is prepared by a knowledgeable curandero. Before engaging, one is asked to prepare for the journey by cleansing the body and mind through fasting, prayers, and setting of intention. And the journeys themselves should be guided in the care of a trained shaman. So once again, with proper preparation of set and setting, we had our first powerful experience, Robert and I. And what I recall most from my first eight hours out-of-body journey with ayahuasca is the all-pervasive presence of snakes. They were everywhere, and it lasted a long, long time. They were around me, above me. They came into my body. And I know that in Western culture, snakes often install a sense of fear. But we have to remember that snakes have forever, throughout antiquity, the ancient world, prehistoric times, been symbols of transformation, regeneration, and healing. What followed during that night were hours of being dismantled until next to nothing remained of me. This initiated what I today perceive of having been the sacred journey of the wounded healer. I was being summoned into the presence of an immensely powerful being, so imposing that I felt infinitely small and entirely inconsequential. In fact, it was so immense that I was unable to see it. I could only sense its overwhelming presence, and then it asked me whether I would now be ready to reconstruct and restructure my being piece by piece. With every piece reintroduced, I had to pledge to take full responsibility and acknowledge that this was my decision only. The process of being reassembled and ultimately reborn took what seemed hours, and I still feel the intense weight that came with finally accepting the sole responsibility for each portion of my being to make me whole again. It was all frightening magical, mind-blowing, as well as healing at the same time. And I feel that Jeremy Nobby describes well how our DNA is changed and transmuted during these very visceral journeys with ayahuasca. When I returned to consensus reality a good 12 hours later, my world had once again shifted and changed profoundly, and with it my art. The Messenger is the first piece I painted after this first life-changing encounter with the Aya Brew. It represents the artist traveler through the veil of consciousness and between the worlds, the one who brings back the otherworldly blueprints to be manifested in this physical reality. Spirit shows one of the great focuses in my art of portraying the infinite energy that animates and surrounds all living things on Earth and throughout the universe. Here a beautiful painting that Robert created of his ayahuasca experiences called Ayahuasca Dream. In 2003, very unexpectedly, Robert was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer with a projected life expectancy of only three months given by his doctors. Together, we took stake of all healing modalities, and Robert decided to largely stay away from allopathic treatments such as radiation and surgery, but to rather explore alternative solutions. 
So with the help of knowledgeable master herbalists and naturopaths, we combined a program of diet changes, supplements, herbal treatments, and poultices. And we also called in the powerful tools of meditation, prayer, creating intention, as well as stepping up our annual travels to the Amazon Basin to engage deeper yet with Ayahuasca and her healing spirits, which turned out to be a very smart move. The art I created during this time was largely an attempt to show the vibrant spirit of the plant medicine teachers, such as Psychotria Veritas or La Chacruna. Caught in the web speaks to the power of ayahuasca. It represents the strong hold that the spirit medicine takes of us once ingested and how, once engaged, we have no choice but to humbly surrender to its profound teachings and healing energy. This brings up the subject of fear during non-ordinary states of consciousness and how it is the mind killer so famously put in Frank Herbert's futuristic novel Dune. I feel that a great prerequisite for engaging in any mind-expanding exploration is absolute humility and acceptance of what might be present for us. This helps us in turn to curb all apprehension and remove the fear that takes away our attention and focus and ultimately a life lived fearlessly is often much richer than one guided by limitations. The ayahuasca journey per se offers us very curious experiences such as synesthesia, um, a mutation of the sensory experiences where we can see sound, hear feelings, taste, smell, and yet another astounding aspect with the vine is the accentuation of telepathic communication between people. Robert and I would often enjoy while traveling together, sharing our vision with our eyes closed and describing to each other the otherworldly spaces we were experiencing. As we explored these ways of communication, the medicine also helped us deal with Robert's health situation and showed us solutions that made his tumor disappear several times over the course of eight years. Transmission speaks to the telepathic communication and the powerful experiences we shared. So, whether we're dealing with psychoactive plants or simple healing plants, I feel that all plant medicines contain powerful spirits that want to connect, communicate, and share their knowledge with us, which is a very curious um, aspect of the plant wor world and uh, something we ought to be paying more attention to. So back to our art for a little while, and um, I'd like to show you how it has always reflected our experiences, inner and outer. And uh, here is an image of uh, Roberts, a painting he created uh, when he asked to see his spirit guide during an ayahuasca session. Uh, this is what he saw, Yahe Guide. Spirit wind is about our connection with the divine and the mystical experience. Alien ascension speaks to the confrontation with the other. The tree of knowledge is about facing the shadow and taking the choice of tasting from the forbidden fruit with a curious effect of attaining more knowledge and insight. Shaman Queen tells the story about being in the presence of the very loving but firm energy of Mother Waska. During the many travels to the Amazon, I would bring pencils and paper and often created these doodles about my experiences. They were jotted down after our journeys and um, helped me remember the intricate visions that I had had. About the strange creatures encountered, the energy experienced. Shipibo grid is a, well, my interpretation of a Shipibo medicine song. 
So these songs embroidered on cloth, as mentioned earlier by the women in the Shipibo tribe, function as journey maps. Here Ricardo, a shaman in training at the time, is explaining an embroidered Ikaro. Via song, the geometric healing designs are embedded in the patient's body, and this process is called an ankana. It creates gradual transformation, and the patterns are literally generative song and sound pattern matrices. When an individual is seeking healing, the curanderos are able to see energetic patterns that are overlaying the patient's body. And wherever they perceive inconsistencies like color changes or disruptions in these patterns, they will take it as a sign that this part of the body, mind or spirit is out of alignment. By singing the Icarus, the patterns are then literally sung back into wholeness, as well as being used to guide the journeyers and help them navigate difficult passages. Today, I'm persuaded that Roberts and my regular visits to Brazil and Peru and receiving the invaluable teachings from ayahuasca miraculously changed Robert's dire early prognosis by his Western doctors of a three months life expectancy into almost nine years of a life fully lived, consciously lived with great joy and love. So sometimes we would actually also teach workshops, painting workshops right alongside the ayahuasca sessions and participate in many conferences in South America. Colloquia and going cutting edge with Graham Hancock, Daniel Pinchback, Nassim Haramein. And then there were the many, many exhibitions. During these years of inner explorations, travels, and teaching art all over the planet, life was so good. It was rich, and it was exciting for Robert and I. And the journeys with the plant teachers had greatly enriched our lives and inspired our art. And the continuous participation in so many amazing events around the globe sometimes kept us traveling up to nine months out of the year. We felt so blessed. Lors de mes voyages avec les plantes, plus particulièrement avec les champignons, un des plus saisissants fut certainement celui en 2013, où je me suis retrouvé dans un immense vaisseau très lumineux en haut d'un escalier. En contrebas, dans une grande salle se trouvaient des êtres humanoïdes, grands, hydrocéphales, qui se tournèrent vers moi en me souriant. Puis je leur dis simplement « Je suis de retour » avec un sentiment de sérénité. C'est après ce voyage que j'eus la conviction de ce lien assez incompréhensible pour toute personne cartésienne, mais qui est une réalité indéniable pour toute personne animée d'une véritable forme de quête spirituelle et qui ont conscience de nos différents états d'expansion. Ces êtres dans mon voyage, je les avais déjà décrits dans un texte écrit vers mes 17 ans et qui parlait de ma naissance qui fut, je dois bien le dire, mon plus grand voyage initiatique. À ma naissance, les médecins accoucheurs ont déclaré à ma mère que je ne respirais pas, que j'étais certainement mort. En réalité, je suis bien là et j'ai fait une mort imminente à ma naissance. J'ai gravé ce souvenir d'une façon cinématographique. Je me revois allongé nu sur une table en acier dans une salle très lumineuse. Je suis adulte et il y a ces êtres tout autour de moi qui me nettoient, prennent soin de moi, s'occupent surtout d'effacer ma mémoire, celle de cette vie qui vient de se terminer. Et puis c'est une renaissance immédiate, je me retrouve devant un passage d'une luminosité incroyable. Enfin j'éternue et les sages-femmes s'activent à nouveau et rassurent ma mère, je suis bien vivant. J'ai dessiné le messager vers 1989 à mes débuts sans trop me soucier du symbolisme sur le moment. J'ai gardé précieusement ce dessin refusant plusieurs fois de le vendre. Est-ce le fait de l'avoir dessiné bien avant dans ma vie que ces êtres sont apparus dans ce voyage est-ce que les plantes m'ont reconnecté à cet instant crucial de ma vie, ma naissance, pour me montrer la véracité de mes pensées 
Quelle que soit la vérité, il y a pour moi une interaction, une communication, un dialogue ou des échanges possibles entre des mondes parallèles, des plans vibratoires différents et nous, lors du travail avec les plantes. Robert's journey with cancer had been powerful and with divine guidance, his body and mind stayed quite strong, very strong actually, and focused on life. Robert was a very positive person and he would just take life a step at a time, which was very, very helpful. Until in 2010, albeit our efforts, his spirit seemed to have decided for him to prepare for the next journey. And when his condition suddenly shifted and Robert's departure became eminent, the best way I knew how to cope and support him, as well as myself during this profound passage, was to create paintings of healing on all levels. Healing Spirit is the last portrait I painted of my husband during his lifetime for the occasion of his last earthly birthday in January 2011. They say that hope dies last and at the time I painted it in the hopes of being able to energetically change the course of his serious illness. But what I see most today is the portrayal of his kind and serene disposition in the face of his eminent transition. Curandera was created during the last months of Robert's life, once again in support of his healing, physical, and emotional, and I've tried to portray the extremely benevolent mother spirit of ayahuasca and her divine grace, and I've represented her as a shape-shifting creature, half human and half snake. When Robert transitioned in August of 2011, the person I had called home for 30 years took away with him the very ground I had been standing on for quite a while and a dark cloud seemed to be lodging itself over my existence. What followed were powerful years of facing my shadow like never before. My art took on a much more somber tone as I was undergoing a deep journey with integrating the experiences of having witnessed death so closely and my experience of grieving. I count myself extremely lucky to have had the teachings of the entheogenic experiences to fall back on and to now guide me through this extended dark journey. So I used all my tools and resources and became the shaman of my own life. This is a self-portrait as a shapeshifter. But thankfully, within the times of darkness, there are also moments of expansion. When I painted Guardians in 2012, a woman emerging from the waters and surrounded by her guardian snake spirits, I had no idea how prophetic it would prove to be. That same year, my beloved mother Lisa developed a serious health problem she had lived alone after my father's unexpected death in 2009 and needed my presence. So I would travel back and forth between the US and Europe frequently over the following years. So it was in late 2012 during one of those trips that I had briefly met a French visionary artist by the name of Pascal Ferry during the visionary art exhibition of Chimera in France. Pascal's work felt strangely familiar to me and spoke of the same spirit and search for the light that I had devoted my life and art to. There was an immediate sympathy and understanding between us, but I was in the depth of grieving and we would only see each other again much later. Just a few months after our first encounter, beginning of 2013, Pascal fell gravely ill and was diagnosed with the final stages of Lyme disease. He had lost 54 pounds, battled for his life for many months and experienced the devastating effects of partial paralysis and memory loss. Thankfully, 
Pascal's guides had presented him to an amazing naturopath who was able to save his life with unconventional methods. Bien plus tard, et après de nombreuses expériences, je me suis aperçu de l'importance primordiale des plantes lors de mon grave problème de santé avec la maladie de Lyme en phase terminale. Les plantes nous parlent, mais le plus souvent, nous ne savons pas écouter ou nous ne faisons pas attention. Là où j'habitais à l'époque, il y avait, dans les champs environnant la maison, des cardaires en grande quantité. C'est en grande partie cette plante qui va ensuite me sauver grâce à une vieille recette amérindienne. Mais je n'ai découvert cela que lorsque j'ai rendu visite à Martina aux états unis pour la première fois et qu'un de ses amis a créé pour moi une teinture mère spéciale de d'air préparée alchimiquement ou spagiriquement que j'ai utilisée dans le cadre de mes traitements naturels. Aujourd'hui, je remercie cette plante d'avoir réussi à renverser et guérir la maladie de Lyme et de m'avoir sauvé la vie. Donc encore une fois, l'interaction avec les plantes m'avait aidé et les plantes avaient pris soin de moi. I understood Pascal's deep journey of the wounded healer very well, and I supported him from afar with emails and Skype calls as best as I could. Through this, our connection grew deeper, and when the worst was over and Pascal had somewhat gathered his strength, we decided to set aside a couple of weeks far away from the world to encounter each other for the first time. When I returned home to Boulder, I found my house flooded in the Colorado disaster of fall 2013. My home had to be partially gutted and rebuilt over the next eight months. What a metaphor. And the universe was asking me to start over. Once this was achieved, I returned to Germany quickly and I mostly cared for my beloved mom until her departure in 2015. And this was really the final blow for me. I felt a great need to get away from everything. I was so tired. So I joined Pascal in Brittany in France, and I largely retreated from the world and spent much time walking the isolated beaches. And for the first time in my life, I allowed myself to really, truly fall apart and lived what I now understand to have been a deep depression. It is true that in order to rebuild and rebirth the new, we sometimes just have to allow ourselves to humbly surrender to the complete dissolution of the old as the journeys with the plant spirit medicines had shown me so many times before. The following years, while navigating the shadow as best as I could, another trusted tool was present, my art. So I focused the little energy I had left on creating new paintings that I feel are, in a sense, more direct, more honest expressions of my soul and more authentic than ever before. And with them, I invited a deeper acceptance into my life. And spirit animals would appear on my canvases, like Beja Flor, the colibri, or the sacred deer, and announce themselves to help me express and see the light again, the light that is always going side by side with the shadow. Lining to the realm speaks to the surrendering to any challenging energy and situation given to us, and the importance of finding strength by aligning ourselves to our inner strength. Universal Mother was painted in honor and loving memory of my mother Lisa. It was my way to transmute my earthly relation with her back into the eternal bond we share. For the final part of our presentation, Pascal and I would like to speak about the inner journey and the alchemical processes of art that have gracefully created the continuous changes as well as ongoing transmutations within our beings, and with it, how art can be used as a tool for transformation. En ce qui concerne mon travail de peintre, je le considère avant tout comme une recherche personnelle qui tient tout autant de l'alchimie, de l'archéologie et d'une initiation spirituelle, une expérimentation d'un monde physique. 
Since the beginning, my work is an attempt to portray the energy that animates all life. To me, this energy matrix of all life is a unifying universal force beyond the confines of cultural and religious differences. Pour l'alchimie en premier lieu, notre métier de peintre visionnaire est une quête de la lumière. Comment la saisir, la transmettre sur la toile avec comme moyen la peinture à l'huile et un médium, notre matière, minéraux et liquides, qui vont créer une réaction chimique, l'oxydation, pour fixer nos visions, le creuset étant en quelque sorte notre palette. I largely experience the creative process as a form of channeling energy and information onto the canvas, if you will. This energy arrives from a place beyond my individual self, and I like to think that the authentic inspiration comes from a rather higher perspective of existence, a higher self, and maybe the divine itself. Ultimately, in art, as in the entheogenic experience, we become vessels for this divine information. And the artist, as well as an initiate's body, literally seem to become the cauldron where our base elements are being burned and ultimately the body cauldron turns into the alembic that distills the cleaned components into an elevated form of ourselves. En tant qu'artiste, je me vois plus comme un archéologue dépoussiérant métaphoriquement la toile vierge en laissant apparaître progressivement mes visions de nos mémoires ancestrales. Artists have forever charted invisible territories of other worlds, as well as having created maps of their inner landscapes. Quant à l'initiation, elle se fait jour après jour, avec une grande humilité et gratitude envers ce cadeau que nous a offert la création. By embracing our oneness as a global human family, the interdependency of all life, as well as our universal interconnectedness. We have a chance to heal and transform the planet's current state of woundedness and ourselves. J'aime à penser, et depuis ma plus tendre enfance, que mes songes utopiques ne sont que le fruit de ma réalité future. Age-old mystical teachings tell us that it is the image we hold in our mind's eye that is the one which will come to pass. So I feel as artists we hold a great responsibility for the content of our creations as we contribute to the changing of the world by imprinting the viewer with our visions. In this pursuit, Art appears as a tool for transformation that might shift the way we perceive our daily lives. This is an invite to collectively shift reality by creating images, may they be mental or on canvas, of a shared reality as beautiful, healthy and strong as our imagination can see. And it turns out that visionary and the art created with it literally refers to thinking about planning the future with imagination or wisdom. And our prayer is for us collectively beginning to bring in more light via the plant spirit medicines, via art, via meditations. There are many tools at our disposition. It is a good and tremendous journey, and our biggest journey called life.
Okay, okay. So, this so this is, is this must be the Q and A period, but we're hoping, we're hoping to hear the questions of our, of our audience. audience. I hope you enjoyed first of all the presentation, and until, and until we, are, we are connected with our host, we would we would just be standing by. by and. Uh, Hello, Martina. Hello, Pascal. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi Stephen. Finally, there. you're there. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say that that was exquisite. Uh, beautiful. So just the whole idea that it's so positive, it's about healing, it's about the potential for humanity. I love the way that you took it up into that sort of larger realm of a wounded planet that can, you know, that can heal through uh, medicines and, you know, the, the various techniques and so on and so on. So thank you. We only actually have one question. Uh, um, I hope you can understand it. You might need to ask me to translate it again. Uh, it goes okay, like this, okay. it's from Eileen Page, and she says, Thank you for sharing your journey in such beautiful and inspiring art. I'm curious about the medicine, in that it sounds like set, setting, and intention, and doses were for spiritual immersion and understanding, and that emotional body and mind healing were part of, but not the main <clears throat> intention. In other, in other words, she seemed to think that you were focused more on the transcendent element of, of things uh, and not so much on the emotional body and mind healing. Uh, I, that's not the way I saw your production, to be honest, but uh, no, no. perhaps you could <laughs> no, speak no. to that a little anyway. Yes, of, yes, course. of course. You know, I, I, I definitely I feel that, that uh, well, in my experience, experience I've, I've seen, seen that ayahuasca heals on all levels. All levels. And, and uh, certainly, certainly um, healing, healing, the healing the body is one aspect, aspect but you know, you know healing, healing the body, body often or, or most, most times is, is, directly is directly affected by healing the mind and the spirit first. first. So while, while a lot of my experiences were transcendent, transcendent and this is kind of like maybe the nature of how I connect to the universe and how I, I've had early experiences in life that have given me this connection, um, I also had... Um, encounters, encounters with um, darkness, darkness, with fear, fear and struggling through the whole uh, situation, uh, situation of being in a realm that is very alien very and very overwhelming. overwhelming. But, but uh, ultimately, every, every, every aspect of our being and nature is being transformed and uh, transmuted during these experiences. All right. Well, thank you so much. And... Uh, Again, we, we don't have any other questions. Uh, I think people are mostly just uh, blown away by what they've seen. Um, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, really appreciate it. And the, the love and care that you put into creating that program uh, is indicative of the love and care that you put into your work and vice versa. So thank you again for that. And, and I'd like to say uh, the, the crew that uh, is our support crew who, who's running a lot of the stuff in the back end, they're just mesmerized and, and amazed like, wow, with the art and uh, your presentation. So thank you so much for, for what you brought to our conference this year. I was very grateful for what, what you bring well, to the table. Well. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And well, and, and now we're going to have a word from one oh, of our. Thank, yeah. Th <laughs> thank you. Good, and good, good night. Bonsoir. Yeah, thank you so much. You so much. So we're going to have a word from good one night. of our sponsors, who's been a sponsor of the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, if, if I'm not mistaken, from the very beginning. And Banyan Books has supported us as the official book provider and retailer locally here in Vancouver, and. You know, they're an independent bookstore. They've supported us with the psychedelic titles for so many, different, um, so, so many different of our presenters over the years, and they've always done a great job. And it is a very different venue this year, the way that we're doing this virtually. So we wanted to just let you know that they do have great books. They've, Colin puts together a great collection of, of, of books for the conference, and he does have some books. Uh, books available from Martina Hoffman at Banyan Books. They ship internationally, and we do want to thank Banyan Books for what they s provide and support for us, for the community locally here in Vancouver. And you know, it's an interesting time. The world's been changing, so you know, please support our sponsors in Banyan Books because they've got all the books you could ever get as well, and, and they ship worldwide. So we thank Banyan Books for their support, and we ask you to support them as well when you're 
doing your shopping for books. thank you so much.